Um, <clears throat> would you turn with me to the, to the uh, 19th chapter of Luke? We're going to be one more, one more week this week in uh, this wonderful story of Zacchaeus. I know it may seem like we've overdone that, but it's such a great passage that, re- that relates to the whole Bible. It's, you know, it's salvation in a nutshell. The sinner, the Savior, and salvation. What's it all about? And uh, so I felt it best to camp there for a while. We'll, I promise you we'll move a little faster as we move through Luke after this. But uh, one more reading. Would you stand with me in respect for the Word and for the God who has given it to us as we read from this chapter, Luke 19, beginning in verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner? And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone for anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Uh, We are, as always, not only undeserving, but incapable of truly explaining and expounding it. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit will descend upon us for that purpose. We look to him to give us insight, to give us understanding, and to stir our hearts and souls to the very core with the message of this passage of Scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. These uh, last two verses that we read, verses 9 and 10, of course, leave no doubt as to what this passage is about. It's about salvation, right? The whole purpose of the incarnation. This is as good a Christmas sermon as I could preach, because this is why Christmas is, why God became a man, to seek and to save the lost. It's all about salvation. We've said the passage divides easily into three parts. You know, we have the sinner in verses 1 through 4, that's Zacchaeus. We've looked at him, found that he teaches us that we're all eligible because we're all in the same boat. We've looked at the Savior in verses 5 through 7, where we learned that Jesus of Nazareth who looked to all the world as he was here like any normal man and yet was anything but because he was the God-man who came to seek and to save the lost. And today we look at verses 8 through 10, which really gives us insight into what this salvation is all about. What does it mean to be saved? What is salvation? We just went through Thanksgiving, and I read of one young man, a relatively new husband who was very proud to carve the turkey for the first time on Thanksgiving. I have to confess, after however many years of marriage, I still don't know how to carve the turkey. But uh, this young man uh, was very proud that he had learned to do this. He had practiced it. He was all ready. And so on the day of uh, of Thanksgiving, he carved the turkey into beautiful, thinly sliced pieces of meat that were laid out just perfectly. And then he turned to his father-in-law, who was a surgeon, a well-known surgeon, and he said, how, how, how do you like that for a stunning bit of surgery? So the old man kind of, you know, grinned and laughed, and he said, well, he said, I'll give you, that's pretty good. He said, now, let's see you put it all back together. <laughs> let's see you get it to work again. Because, see, that's the key to surgery, right? And that's exactly what this passage is about. That's what salvation is about. Salvation is about God putting back together the mess that man has made of the wonderful gift of creation and of life that God has given to us. It's about reversing the effects, all of the effects, 
most of which we don't even understand, but the effects of the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden way back there, however many years ago that was, putting them all back together. But those are effects that in the meantime have embedded themselves into the life of every person who has ever been born and who has ever lived. We are born into that loss. It is those effects that caused Zacchaeus to make money his God over religion, over relationships, because he had lost all of those, over his country, because he had certainly lost the allegiance of his country by his choice of being a tax collector. He'd given up everything else for that. But his God, as all idols do in the end, had left him empty and unfulfilled and helpless to save himself. But that's exactly why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save the lost. And Zacchaeus eagerly reaches out and grasps the rope that Jesus throws to him. Unfortunately, so many people do not. But the Bible has a word of warning about that as well. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, God says this. He says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? There is nothing like what God has done here. This is unique in human history. This is the only way to have a relationship with God. This is the only way to have peace with God. It is a great salvation that he has provided. And if it's great in God's mind, imagine what it must need to be in our mind. So why is salvation so great? This passage gives us four insights, I think, that help us understand. What is it that is so great about salvation? Number one. Salvation is promptly transacted. Salvation is promptly transacted. Now, as we sit here this morning, I don't know if we realize how many people in this world don't know whether or not they are saved, even if they think about it at all. Those who do think about it may think that they are. They may suppose that they are. They may hope that they are. I saw a bunch of, uh, of interviews that uh, Ray Comfort did in a video that Jason sent me this week where he was asking college students, do you know, you know did you, do, are, are you right with God? Do you believe in God? And those who did had various answers to why they thought they were going to be okay, but no one knew for sure. Because you see, if your way of getting right with God is by being good, you will never know for sure. You can never be assured that you're good enough. You can never know if you're good enough today or you're going to be good enough tomorrow. It's a fog of uncertainty and doubt that encompasses anyone who is trying to work their way to God. There's the old story, you know, about the Sicilian king Dionysius who had a friend named Damocles who saw all the glory of the kingship of Dionysus, so he wanted to be the king as well. Thought that would be a great thing. And when Dionysus found out, he said, hey, how about let's just, let's just let's trade for a day. Let's just trade places. And so they did. And so Damocles suddenly found himself in the palace. He found himself surrounded by luxury on every side. Every whim of, of his, every wish that he had fulfilled immediately. It was wonderful, except for one thing. Dionysus had hung that sword of Damocles over his head. Remember that? Hanging there by the thin hair of, a, of the hair of a horse tail to teach him the uncertainty of power. And it didn't take long for Damocles to opt out and to say, let's trade back. But you see, those who are uncertain outside of Christ about their eternal future have no place to opt out. There's no way to escape the uncertainty because the fact is that outside of Christ, we are lost. Outside of Christ, we do have no hope. That is not the salvation that Jesus answers or, or offers. It's not a salvation that exists of trying to climb up the mountain to get to God. If only you can be good enough. It's nothing like that. 
Salvation that Jesus offered is available and it is transacted the moment we repent our sin and turn our faith and heart to him. It is immediate and it is permanent. Look at verse 5. I say to you that I am coming to your house today. I'm coming now. Look at verse 9. Today salvation has come to this house. When Jesus came, so did salvation. And beloved, it came to stay. Now we know if you've studied the Bible or been through some of the uh, classes or even heard some of the sermons that we preached here, that salvation is ultimately comprised of three parts, right? It's comprised, first of all, of, uh, of a great theological term, justification, justification, acquittal, a legal removal of guilt. doesn't mean that you're suddenly good. It doesn't mean that we are suddenly better than we were. But it means that God has forgiven the guilt that attaches to us. It's not a result of our being good. It's a result of our putting our faith in, in Christ, what Christ has done for us, and accepting his righteousness in our place, and God imputing that righteousness to us, and therefore justifying us, even though we don't deserve it. And so Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can know, certainly, that you have peace with God. That's justification. It's a one-time act. It happens, and you are at peace with God. But that's followed by a second part of, a second element of, of salvation, which is called sanctification. Another wonderful theological term, sanctification. You could call it holification. It's the same word in the Greek language. It's the process by which God begins to make us perfect, begins to make us Christ-like, because that's what he does with everyone who comes in faith to him. That's what the process of salvation is about. It's the process by which he takes us from the position that we have in Christ as Christians and helps us become that in reality. And so for every Christian, there is a movement from who we are to who we are to become when we are in glory with him, when we are perfect. Not perfection in this life, but aiming in that direction and moving in that direction. That's one of the ways you know that you're a Christian. There's a change, and we'll see that in a little bit. And then finally, there's the third phase of salvation, which is glorification. That's the time when either when we die or when God Christ comes again, when he completes the perfection in our life, and we become those who are no longer in any way subject to sin. The perfection is made complete. The body is changed to one that is perfect, to one that will be forever and that will last forever. That's the process that we have to look, for, look, look forward to, and that's what salvation is all about. But that salvation locks in place irrevocably the moment that we repent our sins and turn in faith to Christ. Colossians 3.1 says, as we have memorized, if then you have been raised with Christ. If you have been raised with Christ, and the assumption is as a believer that we have been raised with Christ. How long did it take for Christ to be raised? Moment of time, right? One moment he's in the tomb, the next moment he is gone. Lazarus was resurrected by Jesus Christ. How long did it take? Jesus called out, Lazarus, come forth, and there he was. Only takes a moment and salvation, beloved, is the same way. It takes a moment in time. Salvation is immediate. Abraham, the Bible tells us in Romans 5, 4, 3, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It happened right then. There was no waiting around to see if he would be good enough. He wouldn't. His salvation was given because Christ would be good enough in his place. And so Abraham was justified by faith the moment he believed God. The Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 was saved the moment that his heart reached out to God in faith. Paul was saved on the road to Damascus immediately. It's a good thing that the thief on the cross didn't have to go do something or wait around, right? He was saved 
The moment that his heart changed from one of mocking Christ to one of believing that Christ was his only possibility of salvation. And Jesus turned to him and said, today, don't you love the word? Are you getting to like that word? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Those are the promises of God. This is what salvation is all about. This is, this is the, the nature of it in 2 Corinthians chapter, five, uh, chapter 6, verse 2. Paul says, behold, now is the day of salvation. Not a whole bunch of days, not a month of Sundays, not maybe at the end of your life. Now is the day of salvation. It's like the old Fanny Crosby hymn. She wrote so many wonderful ones, didn't she? She wrote, Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. To every believer, the promise of God. The vilest defender who truly believes. That moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. That's salvation. It locks in the moment we turn in faith to Christ, confess our sin, and open our heart to him as Zacchaeus has done in this case. You may not be able to pinpoint the exact moment that you came to faith in Christ. I love when we, as elders, get to interview some of the people who are coming to membership in our church, and we ask them a simple question, you know, how have you come to faith in Christ? It's very interesting. Sometimes people can give us the day and the hour almost. Others can say, you know, it's, I, I know, I know the approximate time frame when this happened. I can't tell you the exact day, but I know that my heart changed. And I know that faith in Christ has become mine as a gift of God. It's instantaneous, beloved. It's transacted right now, and you can know, and you are supposed to know. John wrote in chap John chapter 20, verse 21, These things have I written that you may know that you have eternal life. He wants us to believe in God and have life through his name. Salvation is so precious because of that. Secondly, it's a great salvation because salvation is pricely, pri pricelessly treasured. Salvation is pricelessly treasured. Why priceless? Well, we see it in Zacchaeus' case because why? Because it is absolutely unmerited. Zacchaeus was held in contempt by everybody that he knew and everybody that knew him. And there was nothing he could do, humanly speaking, to overcome that. He was a tax collector. He was the worst of the worst. But it wasn't even that that was the worst thing. Even if he had found a way to suddenly become okay with all of his compatriots and the people that he was around, even if he had suddenly quit being a tax collector and become some great beneficiary of society and so on, and tried to work his way into the favor of people, even if he'd been able to do that, he would never have been able to earn God. You can't earn God. His salvation was unmerited. Jesus doesn't seek him out because he deserves it. Zacchaeus had done nothing that might have ingratiated himself to God. It wasn't Jesus arriving on the scene and saying, Hey, Zacchaeus, I've got good news for you. I see that you've become a much better person than you were before. You see that your life has changed. You're, so much, you're just doing so much good that you never thought about before. So the Father has sent me to tell you you're in. It's not the way it works. Didn't, that, didn't work that way for Zacchaeus. It doesn't work that way for any of us. This is God's unmerited favor being freely offered and enthusiastically embraced by a man who was willing to humble himself, repent his sin, and come to faith in Christ. It's a priceless gift. Zacchaeus is he's exhibit one of Titus 3, verse 5, where Paul tells us that God has saved us, not because of works of righteousness that we have done, but because of his great mercy. That's why we're saved. That's why we've come to faith in Christ, because he's given it to us as a gift. Zacchaeus' eyes, when Jesus stopped at that tree and he looked up into his eyes. It, that was mercy with a capital M being exhi exhibited in his life and being given to him. We can never put God in our debt. George Whitfield, the great evangelist who was the human instrument of the first great awakening back there in the 1740s. Wonderful preacher, wonderful man. George Whitfield said this. He said, before you can speak peace to, our, to, to your hearts, 
You must not only be troubled for your sins, but you must also be troubled about your best performances. When someone is awakened to his obligation before God, he immediately flies to his performances to hide himself from God, to patch up a righteousness of his own. So he says, I will be a, I will be a mighty good now. I will reform. I will do all I can, and then certainly Jesus Christ will have mercy on me. But you must see that God may damn you for the best prayer you ever put up. You must be brought to see that all your righteousness, put them all together, are so far from recommending you to God that he will one day see them as filthy rags, that God hates them and rejects them if you bring them to him to recommend you to his favor. You cannot buy God's favor. Nothing we could ever do could put God under obligation to us. And do you see that when we're trying to just be good enough, that's what we're doing? We're basically saying, God, I've been this good. I've done this and, and, and this and this and this and this, and therefore you owe me. God doesn't owe us. He never will owe us. When God gives is freely given, it's like us going to the Queen of England and saying, hey, that Windsor Castle that I just visited, I kind of like that place. Tell you what, I'll work for you for a year. You give me that castle. Good luck, right? You couldn't, get, you couldn't buy a room in the castle with the year's labor, right? You can't put the Queen of England under your obligation any more than you can put God under your obligation. Salvation is priceless because no, no one can ever merit it. No one can ever pay for it. No one can ever earn it, but everyone can accept it. It's a great salvation. Salvation is great, thirdly, because it is personally tendered. Personally tendered. Sunday school teacher, second grade Sunday school teacher, she said to her class, you know, why do you believe in God? And one of the boys answered, said, uh, said well, I don't know, unless maybe it's just something that runs in our family. Perhaps that's true. Hopefully it is true. But I don't care whether it runs in your family or not. It doesn't run in you until you have personally accepted it. Do you see? It's not a matter of personal connections. Now, your family may, have, may give you a tremendous advantage. You may be privileged, as I was, to be born into a Christian family where you get to hear the Word of God. You get to hear about the grace of God. You, hear, you get to understand what Christmas is about kind of from, the, from your youth on up. It can, make, it can be a privileged position, but it can never save you. Salvation is not a matter of the connections that you have. It's not a question of being born into the right family or being born into the United States or something else. The road that we're on that leads to destruction is wide. The road that leads to eternal life is narrow, according to Jesus. And he says you have to... It takes violence to break down the door to get in. It's a narrow door. It's a one person, one-way door. You have to go through it for yourself. No one else can go through it for you, you see. Personal decision. Jesus came to Zacchaeus personally. Zacchaeus had to decide himself. No one can decide for him. He's not accepted because he's in the right group. Now, look at verse 9, because verse 9 almost looks like that's the case. Read it again. He says, Today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. Seems almost at first glance to be saying, he's a Jewish person, so of course he's saved. But read it again. It says, Today salvation has come. Today. So when did Abraham, so when did Zacchaeus become a child of Abraham physically. On the day he was born, right? 30, 40 years later, I mean earlier. We, we don't know exactly how old he was, but whenever he was born, he became a son of Abraham physically. He was a Jew from day one. So it can't be physical ethnicity that Christ is referring to here. So what is it? It's spiritual ethnicity. It's rebirth. Zacchaeus, like all of us, has to be born again. Zacchaeus was born as a Jewish person whenever he was born physically. But today, this day, he's been born again spiritually. 
He was a Jew outwardly before. Now he's a Jew both outwardly and what? Inwardly. That's what Jesus is saying. It's not a matter of he's saved because he was connected with the Jewish people. Being connected with the Jewish people gave him tremendous advantage in those days. Ephesians tells us that. But it doesn't save you. The old thing that the rabbis used to teach the Jews that Jesus was, or that God was sitting, or that Abraham, Father Abraham was sitting at the gates of hell making sure no Jew never went in was the furthest thing from the truth. He saved because he became a Jew inwardly. It was a personal response to the invitation of Jesus. We must never think that, you know, that our salvation comes about young people. Got a lot of young people here. You must never think that you're saved because your parents are saved. That's, it's wonderful that they are. It doesn't save you. Maybe you're a parent here and think you're saved because your kids are saved. It's not true. Salvation is a personal decision. It must be accepted by each one of us individually. Connection has nothing to do with it other than to perhaps give us a little bit of an edge in the knowledge that we have. I love how John Stott says it in his book, Basic Christianity. John Stott was, a, he was an Anglican theologian in England for many years. Just died a couple of years ago. Wonderful man of God. But he, said, he, was he talked in one of his books, Basic Christianity, about how he came to faith in Christ. I think at about age 15, if I remember right. And he said, you know, before that, he thought that the fact that Jesus died on the cross put everyone in the world right. Jesus died for the sins of the world, so everybody must be saved, right? Everything's okay. He said it was a shock to him to discover that, no, you have to accept what Jesus did on the cross personally. He was offended by that. He says, he, he, here's the way he says, he says, I remember how puzzled, even how offended I was when it was first suggested to me that I needed to take hold of Christ in his salvation for myself. I came to realize that while Jesus Christ is the Savior, I must accept him as my Savior. This, putting, this way of putting things is certainly prominent in the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my light and my salvation. You, God, are my God. So the question this morning isn't, is Jesus the Savior? The question is, is he your Savior? Is he my Savior? See? It's our decision. Stott says Revelation 3.20 was one of the most helpful verses to him. You know, the one we use often. It says, where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door, anyone will open the door. Not a group of people on your behalf. Not your mom and dad opening it for you, but you opening that door personally. If anyone will open that door, I will come in. It's your decision. Young people, it's yours and no one else's. Older people, it's yours and no one else's. You know, there are certain things we do alone. Have you noticed that? You're born alone, unless you happen to be twins. And then you're still coming out alone, one at a time. Right? You're born alone. You're going to die alone. You know, if we're fortunate, our loved one is holding our hand or something else, but when you go, you go alone. You don't take them along. And we must come to faith in Christ alone. It's a personal decision. Fourthly, salvation is amazing. Salvation is great because... It is powerfully transforming. Powerfully transforming. Let me assure you this on the basis of what the Bible teaches time after time and place after place. If you come to faith in Christ, there will be change in your life. You cannot come to faith in Christ and remain the same person that you were before. It is not possible. We see that in this passage. Look at verse 8. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. I have to kind of, you know, get the scene in mind. What's, what's going on here? 
Jesus and Zacchaeus have proceeded to Zacchaeus' house by this time. It's not completely clear in the text, but that's what's happened. And as they do so, the crowd is murmuring, you know, all the way along. What is this? Jesus, he's going to the home of a sinner. Little realizing. That's exactly why he came. To seek and to save the lost. So of course he's going to his home. It was his whole purpose, beloved. That's why those Pharisees who were standing by were not going to be saved. Jesus said, I came, I came like a physician to the sick, not to those who are well. He didn't mean that they were really well, but they thought they were well. And so they would never come to faith in him. But Zacchaeus does, and he stands up, and he says, Behold, Lord. He doesn't call him Jesus. He calls him Lord. Why? Because the word Lord incorporates so many things that Zacchaeus has found out this day. See, the word Lord, kurios, represents the Hebrew word Jehovah, Yahweh. In saying Lord, he is number one recognizing him as God. In saying Lord, he is recognizing him as master of his life. He's recognizing him as boss. He's acknowledging that there is a new manager in his heart, and it's not him, it's God. Lord, that's what it means. This is Romans 10, 9 in living color. Romans 10, 9. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Salvation, right? You will be saved. Now Zacchaeus didn't know Jesus was raised from the dead because Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead yet. But he believes in who he is. He believes that somehow he's going to provide for his salvation. He doesn't know how yet. But he believes what he knows. And it's enough. And so he says, Lord. But that's not the end. That's just the beginning, right? That's just the beginning. That's just the beginning because saving faith transforms. Saving faith happens in a moment of time, but it leads to a lifetime of change or it wasn't real. Do you see? It happens in a moment of time, but it leads to a lifetime of change. Grace in this case, has gone through Zacchaeus like a lightning bolt. And so he stands up in front of everybody, and he looks at Jesus, and he says, Lord, God, my new master, my master is no longer Rome. My master is no longer myself. My master is Jesus. And here's the first phase of the changes that are going to occur. I'm going to give half of everything I have away to the poor. And if I have defrauded anybody, it's a first class if condition, which means that it should be translated, if I have defrauded anyone, and I assume that I have, I'm going to pay him back fourfold. Now let me tell you, that is grace, because that's a tax collector. They weren't all about how to give money away. They were about how to get money from people. They would have made great Television evangelists. Oh, I'm sorry I said that. How could, I, how could that possibly come out of me? They would have. That's what they were about. How do you get money out of people? And Zacchaeus is standing up saying, I'm going to give it away. I'm going to give away half of what I have. And, and those people that I've defrauded, I'm going to give back to them fourfold. Listen, what did the law require? The law required said, hey, 10% of your income should go to God, right? And he says, I'm going to give 50. That's grace in action. The law required in Leviticus 6.5 that if you had cheated someone and you were going to pay them back, there should be a 20% penalty attached to that. So if you cheated out of $100, you owed them $120. Zacchaeus says, no, no, I'm going to give them 400%, not 20% penalty, 400%. That's grace. That's salvation that transforms. We don't change, beloved, in order to get. 
God's love and approval. We change because we already got God's love and approval. Salvation doesn't come after change. Change comes after salvation. So don't say, I got to clean up before I come to Christ. Come to Christ and he'll do the cleaning up. Change is the result. It's not the cause of faith. Religion says I have to do something, therefore I'm accepted. Saving faith says I'm accepted, therefore I do. In both cases, there is doing. But there's a huge difference in the motivation. Do you see that? When Zacchaeus says, I'm going to give away half of everything, I'm going to pay back and all this kind of stuff, this is a sign that salvation has already come. Salvation has arrived at that home today. And what it's going to result in is all these changes that Zacchaeus is announcing already. What's happened? This is the fruit of repentance. This is the fruit of salvation. This is Jesus coming in and inhabiting every every corner and nook and corner of his heart. This is Jesus becoming the center of his existence. And that's what salvation is. That's why it's so great. But if Jesus isn't the center of your existence, if Jesus isn't in every nook and corner of your existence, you need to question whether you really belong to him. That's why the Bible constantly presents it as sitting down and having dinner. You know, when he says, I'm gonna, uh, you open the door and I'll come in and sup with you. What does that mean? I'm going to have dinner with you. See, in those days, it was different than today. Today, we invite somebody over. We have a pizza and we all go our way, right? Not in those days. See, in those days, somebody came over, you, you know, you lit the torches, you ate all evening, and then, you know, because you didn't have a hotel to stay in, you all went to bed, and you all went to bed in the same room, because there was only one room in the house anyway. You were part of each other. It was an intimate association that came with this having meals together that we don't quite understand. But what this is, is Jesus, by coming to Zacchaeus' house, he's illustrating He's illustrating that salvation is not about just meeting him on Sunday. It's about being his all the time. We're imperfect at it, beloved, I know that. I know more than any of you here today how imperfectly we sometimes follow Christ. But I'll tell you this, if you are really a true believer in Christ, it will transform your life because he will transform your life. Just like he transforms Zacchaeus' life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Is there any better illustration of that in the Bible than Zacchaeus? It's a whole new way of living. It's a whole new way of looking at life. It's a whole new agenda. Change touches every area of his life, including his money. Let me tell you, when Jesus touches somebody's pocketbook, you know they've been changed, right? It doesn't come natural for us to be givers. And so he's been changed. Jesus come in and he's no longer the old man that he was before. Zacchaeus has come down from his tree because Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to climb his tree to provide the forgiveness that Zacchaeus required. Zacchaeus has gone from being despised and rejected to being accepted because Jesus is about to be despised and rejected on his behalf because he's taking his sin on himself. Zacchaeus has gone from being the littlest man in town to the biggest man in town because Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem to become the, to become the most humiliated of the humiliated in our place. The realization of that grace is what drove the great change in Zacchaeus' life. It is a great salvation, beloved, because it's a great God who is providing it. So salvation, come to your house, to your house. 
So what are the changes that show that it's real? Patty and I on this recent trip, or by the way, some of you wonder where we were. We were from Los Angeles to Seattle on the West Coast, mostly, seeing grandchildren. We got to see them all in one trip, which is a trick these days, but it was, it was wonderful. But one of the things we did in Southern California was to go down to Newport Beach in Orange County and eat in one of our favorite seafood places that we used to like to go to once in a while. And it reminded me of the story of a friend of mine, acquaintance anyway, Kent Hughes, wrote the book Disciplines of a Godly Man. Some of you guys are, I remember we've gone through that book. Kent used to like to go down there too with his wife and they would have dinner and and then sometimes they would take, there was a, there's a little ferry boat down there that goes from the mainland over to Balboa Island, crosses Bel, the Balboa Bay into Balboa Island. If you want to find the most ex, some of the most expensive property in the world, that's where you would go. Um, and it's not all that great, it's just expensive. <laughs> but uh, the, the ferry would go across, and used to, you know, just for fun, we used to go across, you know, get some ice cream, ride the little Ferris wheel or whatever. And they used to do that, and... As they were doing that, they met the captain of one of the boats, one of the ferry boats. His name was Big Jim, profane man. But somehow they got talking about Jesus, and they got talking about Christ. The guy asked Kent what he did, and he said he was a pastor, and he didn't have any, want to have anything to do with pastors. But uh, Kent said, well, how about Jesus? Would you like to have anything to do with Jesus? Oh, Jesus. And so they began to talk about Jesus, and Kent presented to him who Jesus really is. It was a several conversations until finally Big Jim invited them into his home one day down in Newport Beach. And he'd come to the place where he said, you know what, I'm no good, but I want Christ if he will have me. And Christ had him. See, because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, not just in Zacchaeus' time, but he's still doing that today. He's still seeking and saving the lost, and Big Jim came to faith in Christ, so then he began to go to church. Now, Kent's church was way up in La Mirada. That's like, I don't know, 20, 25 miles from Newport Beach, but Big Jim would drive up there. <laughs> Kent said he was still a little rough around the edges. He said every once in a while he'd come out and tell me, man, that was a hell of a sermon this morning, Pastor. <laughs> still a little rough around the edges. But he said he loved Jesus. He was a true disciple, and his life changed. Kent said this, he said, my favorite memory of Jim is Jim sitting cross-legged in the dirt and cut off, shirtless and tanned, ever the beach boy, working on the church sprinkling system, refusing all advice to go home and rest, saying, after all Christ has done for me, this is the least I can do. Things change when Jesus comes in. I don't care what age you are. If you're a young person, you need to ask yourself, what are your desires and aspirations? And what, you know, which direction are you headed as a young person? Is Christ really in your heart? Because Christ isn't going to take you down the roads of some of the temptations that you're going to find in the school place and among your peers. As older people, where is the change in your life? Where is the desire to get the cookies out to, 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 the, to the neighbors and support the effort that God has put on Kelly's heart that's so simple? You just take the little the little card and put it in a box of cookies and tell how hard is that? How many will we find here on Saturday when we come to distribute cookies to the neighborhood? I mean, this is, these are just simple ways that God wants us to serve him, beloved, that it shows that, the, yeah, there's been a change inside of me. If you don't have that, if you don't have a desire for that, if there's no compassion in your heart for your family and friends who don't have this great salvation, maybe you don't have it either. So you say, well, what if I don't have it? I thought I thought I had it. What do I do? You fall on your face before God and ask him to be merciful. That's all you can do. But I'll tell you what, if you do, he will. As many as received him. To them gave me the power to become sons of God, even those who believe on his name. There's an old question that I always found challenging. Someone said, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to, conv to convict you? We should all ask ourselves that question. What's different from us, from the rest of the world, even the good people that we live around? Good question. Has Jesus truly come home to you? I pray he has, because 
How will we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Let's not neglect it. Let's accept it, and then let's live it out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for the example of Zacchaeus. He challenges us. Lord, I, I pray and trust that most of us here today have come to faith in Christ, but I know there are some who have not. I don't know who they are. You do. You know the hearts. I pray right now, Father, with all that is within me, would you please, right at this moment, turn that heart toward you. Cause those who do not know you to turn to you in faith and say, I, I, I acknowledge my sin, my, my sins of thought and word and deed. It's not just the deeds, but it's, the, it's even the thoughts. Yes, I'm a sinner. I give my life to you. I want to call you not just Jesus of Nazareth. That's great, but you are now Lord, Lord, Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. And then, Lord, as Christians, please help us to have compassion for those around us, to pray for, to work toward ways that will help them come to faith in you. I don't know how we can be Christians and not, Lord, have the fruit of at least pursuing helping others come to faith in Christ. So would you please bring conviction where it's needed, bring comfort where it's needed. Lord, thank you so much for providing such great salvation. Bless us now as we sing together to close our service and make this the prayer of our heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.